So welcome to Lindsay Borgen. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Lindsay, start off by telling us a bit about yourself, please. Sure. Uh, so I am a writer. Uh, I'm an oral historian and I uh, am a 2018 National Geographic Explorer. I live in British Columbia in Canada. I live in the interior of the province, uh, so it's quite forested around here. Um, and I moved here actually to work in oral history. I grew up, uh, I grew up on the prairies in Canada and I've lived kind of all over, uh, but this is, this is where we've ended up. Oh, very nice. And you've written this great book called Tree Thieves, which I absolutely adored. It touches on so many complex issues and how everything's connected. Um, so what inspired you to write this book and carry out this huge amount of research? Well, so in 2012, uh, there was an old growth cedar that was growing on Vancouver Island along the west coast of Canada. And I read a news story about how this the cedar had been poached uh, in the middle of the night. And um, at the time, I thought, well, first of all, I was surprised because, as I said, I grew up in a in a prairie area. So I didn't grow up around big trees and I didn't grow up around the logging economy at all um or forestry at all so I was surprised that this uh happened I was surprised that it could happen and I had a lot of questions about you know where it goes um what type of you know investigation takes place who the who the folks are that do the poaching and I started digging into it and very quickly kind of realized that there was this really well I didn't realize I'd, I'd done so much reading that I found that there was um this really deep history to poaching um, and that timber poaching actually uh, it is quite common um, and that had all these underlying roots to it um, and that the motivations were obviously uh, financial, but that there were a lot of more complicating factors to it. And when, once I knew that it was going to be kind of a bigger story like that, that's when I started to think, okay, well, this could be a book because there's a lot going into not just the crime, but the motivations for the crime and the foundations of the entire region that this crime is taking place in. Fascinating. And timber poaching is nothing new, is it? I mean, you start <laughs> off with a really good overview of history, starting in the UK with Robin Hood. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your thoughts on why Robin Hood did what he did and, and why we still make films about him. You know, what <laughs> was the essence of his success as a poacher? Yeah, and I, you know what I think is really interesting is that there's a so there is um, a kind of no longer uh, well, unfortunately he's no longer with us. But there's a there's a poaching expert named Rory Young, and he uh, he traveled the world, and and you know he he really worked in kind of anti poaching measures and on all sorts of levels. And in the book that he wrote about poaching. Um, he said that the, the issue with Robin Hood or the challenge with Robin Hood and why the sheriff of Nottingham, Nottingham could never catch him was because he had the community on his side. Mm -hmm. And that is something that continues right through until today. And that's because poaching is, is a folk crime. Um, you know, it's a response to uh, a loss of commons and a loss of rights to use the forest in a number yes. of ways and poaching of course we think of it as taking the king's deer for instance right but um there are lots of records uh historical records that talk about the taking of sticks and wood and logs and and, and woodland itself uh from the forest uh because that was a, a sort of bedrock of everyday life it, it and, was, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the rights of two of my favourite words, Estover and Panish, Est in the UK, whereby local people could just take what they needed in a responsible way to exactly to their fires, etc. And if you and their if you look ways. at the if you look at some of the the historical documentation around it, and some of the the kind of court logs or verderers' court logs, right? Because there were often uh, special forest courts for forest crimes. Um, a lot of people were 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 taking wood for cooking purposes, for campfires, 
for building, but not building that we would think of today, like extensive, um, large scale building, but building for personal use. I think that there's there's mention in some of the records of people taking wood to brew beer with. Um, and so this is was small scale, um, but also when when access to that wood was taken away, uh, it had this really sort of large um, negative effect on community um, mm. because it wasn't um, it, it wasn't the way that we might think of conservation now uh, that that stops logging that is clear cut and and unsustainable. You know, it was really a shutting down of uh, a process that just allowed life to unfold. Um, and there are there are stories that come out of that time that continue now uh, that people, you know, people talk about now. And there are folks that I interviewed, poachers that I interviewed who said to me that they felt that they were following in Robin Hood's footsteps. And I think, you know, Robin Hood is the the mythical face on this, but really they're thinking of the people that I was reading about who were charged with with taking wood from the yes. from forests. Yes. So. And and actually, you know, moving a bit forward in time and back to the USA, mm -hmm. um, tell us about the early protection of the Redwood Forest. When was that and how did that start? Who initiated that? Yeah, um, so in the early 20th century, there were there were a group of, um, you know, businessmen, essentially, and leaders, leaders, folks that had their fingers kind of in politics and, and business. Uh, and they took a road trip up from uh, the, the southern part of California up into the north into the Redwoods. Um, and by that point, logging had really kind of taken off in that area. It was actually slow to start, uh, but as logging kind of ticked its way east to west across the United States, you know, eventually the redwoods were, were the edge of that, of that logging and, and quite an impressive one, so much kind of amazing and, and, you know, at the time considered endless, boundless timber <laughs> uh, was coming from that region then. And so uh, a group of three men, um, Miriam, Osborne, and Grant, they took a, they took a road trip up to kind of see about the business happenings in Northern California. And when they saw logging, they were, uh, they were aghast, you know, they, mm -hmm. they felt shocked by it. Um, and they, they began um, a, a organization that would become the Save the Redwoods League, which is a very um, iconic conservation organization in the Pacific Northwest, particularly Northern California. Um, and they did that, you know, this was kind of pre-World War one um you know they did that in a way that uh they knew how at the time which was to solicit donations from very their very wealthy peers um to buy up land that was owned and and being logged by private logging companies and to to set it aside for conservation and so what ended up happening was there was there were these kind of like patchwork areas that had been bought by the save the redwoods league that were that were set aside and couldn't be logged anymore. So they might have been at the top of watersheds or, you know, groves here and there. But logging continued all around it. And I mean, as as your listenership knows, it you know it definitely went kind of waned and came back at, over time with the markets itself. Um, but the early conservation really began in those days with the kind of emotional reaction from from three men who who were not from the area but who had really kind of deep powerful connections and it's very easy to have an emotional reaction of all you know and wonder at the size and majesty of these trees and the book mm -hmm. describes the special ecosystem that they provide and mm -hmm. as I, I think that's probably widely understood by the readership and mm -hmm. you also go on to describe in 1964 that there was a flood as well yeah and so that is because uh well not because but it, you know that was the confluence of a number of events so one of the events is that post second world war there was a real national push to build more homes and this was seen as part of the recovery from the american war effort or what have you 
Um, and logging across the country and the timber industry and mills were just, they were booming. You know, there were a lot of jobs and there was a lot of demand for the product that they were, that they were spitting out. And so um, at the same time, um, a lot of technology had been developed actually for the war that could then be applied to other uh, in industries coming out of it. And so logging was easier. Um, and it became really easy to um, just kind of log way more than it had ever been logged before. Yeah, really quickly and send it to mills and, and have that product kind of start pumping out and, and people really, really seeing the bottom line <laughs> increase. And, yeah. and so there was there were these kind of confluence of events. And um, as many, uh, I, I presume, but as, as a lot of your re listenership might know, um, deforestation at that speed can really destabilize the, the forest floor. Um, you know, it really has an impact on the ecosystem um, that the trees are rooted in. And so <clears throat> in the hills nor in Northern California, um, a, lot of, a lot of clear cut essentially had taken place. Um, there was a lot of um, kind of arid land. Uh, and when a huge rainfall came, um, the, you know, it was the, the, the earth was not able to kind of absorb mm -hmm. this, this water. Um, and there were no trees there that could utilize it and could kind of prevent the the stability of the floor from falling out from underneath it and a landslide took out all the towns at the bottom of these um, wow. valleys. Um, and so that set about, about its own wave of environmental conservation efforts in the North, mm -hmm. in Northern California, because people saw that, including now the Sierra Club and then the later iterations of the Save the Redwoods League. They saw this and they thought, well, here's an example of what happens if we don't stop logging, if we don't stop the clear cut. And efforts really jumped from there and they they lasted for, you know, 20 to 30 years. There was a serious push in those regions to um, remove logging land from logging use and to, um, you know, either conserve it as a park or as a reserve. At what point did, um, oh, this may not be a straightforward answer. Yeah. Sorry, Mula. this may not be a straightforward question to answer, but at what point did it become a reserve? Oh, I call. Yeah. So the first, um, so as I said, there were, there was this kind of patchwork network at the beginning. Right. Um, and then the first iteration of Redwoods National Park was in, uh, founded in 1968. And what that did was it connected some of that patchwork together and some of the land was being uh, managed by the forest service, which in the United States, it's a federal government agency. <clears throat> it's not a park though. So those are lands that are um, owned by the government, and, but they're logged. Some of them might be conserved, but really they have multi-use. They might, you know, you can go on a hike on national forest land. Um, but a lot of that national forest land was, was kind of essentially decommissioned and handed over the, to the National Park Service, which meant that it couldn't be touched anymore that this was full conservation land um and so that was that was kind of the first iteration of that um and then a decade later that land expanded and so the park expanded and it also took into um uh, into account some of the state parks uh that were that were surrounding that area and so this must have had an enormous impact on people's lives so so it when did. the when this all happened, what was the typical demographic of the towns in the area? And how did yeah. it affect people's identity? Mm -hmm. um, so <clears throat> what we know now, um, and, and, and the, the context in which I wrote about it and spoke about it is really from 19, late 1960s on. Um, and But we know that these towns, uh, you know, they had often been founded due to their location in the forest or at the edge of the forest near mills or mills would be built within the town um, and then often as um, dairy towns as well in northern california there is you know there's the redwood curtain as they call it so just 
deep redwood forest, but then also these very lush valleys that were really perfect for, for dairy cattle. Um, and so these were the types of towns that young families were moving to because work was there. Uh, they may have settled in the early 20th century and, and not left for, for quite a long time. Um, I interviewed some families who had really deep roots in logging itself, and so they often moved to Northern California from other regions where they're, they were involved, their fathers essentially were involved in logging. And the, in the small towns that, that I visit, uh, you know, there's a town called Oric, uh, there's a town called Scotia, and then as you go further north, there's, there's all these small towns, Forks, etc. Um, their, their tax base came from the mills, it came from yeah. logging. Um, and it came from the money that people earned doing that and pumping it back into the town. Mm -hmm. And so when the park was first proposed, uh, there was a, a, a fair bit of feedback um, from town people saying, you know, what is this, what is this going to mean for our communities if we can't log around here? There, at the very beginning in 1968, there, there was actually a little bit more of a balanced approach to this because they had because the flood was so recent um, and there was an understanding that listen maybe clear-cut logging isn't sustainable and isn't good for us um, but the argument on the other way is that um, they had heard from many people in charge that tourism would bring so many people to the region that you would no longer need logging and they were very um, suspicious of that claim. Yes, and it turned out rightly so, because if mm -hmm. we flood a sensitive area with people, it's going to affect the ecosystem, it's going to cause yep. all sorts of imbalances. And mm -hmm. so, um, I mean, I read in your book that this really was intergenerational sense yeah. of identity, yeah. as well as a way of making a living, a sense of pride, strong communities. Really, that was yeah. taken away, and there was no direct government funding for those individuals? It, there was, um, in 1968, there was not. When the park expanded in 1978, there actually was some uh, government funds that were handed down, um, but they were provided either through the companies that were that were seeing work reductions or through the county itself. And a lot of people just never, never saw the benefit of the, that fund. Um, just to go back to what you were saying about energy generational, I mean, there, you know, there's a quote in the book and there, there's a quote in some sources of a teacher saying, you know, I'm not from here, but when I arrived, I noticed that what happens is that a father goes into the woods and soon after his son follows. And that, um, that is borne out by the stories that I heard during my interviews there. I mean, this is an inherited position often, um, you know, I think it can feel quite uh, quaint to say that it's, um, you know, it's not a job, it's a lifestyle or, or what have you, but really for a lot of folks, that is true. You know, I remember I would, I would ask people like, do you remember when you first learned how to use a chainsaw? And they'd say, no, I was just always around them. Like, I, I don't actually know. It, I think one of the one of the poachers who I spoke to, he said it was just through osmosis. Like yeah. I didn't actually learn. Um, and, and I don't think that they're exaggerating. You know, I think yeah. that that really is, um, it reminds me in a lot of like that reminded me in a lot of ways of the, the ranching and the farming communities that I grew up in. Um, it was, it is a job and, a, and an important one. Um, and, and people do it, um, because it's part of, who their family is and like part of where they belong um and that led that can lead to some really difficult conversations um when things are brought up as kind of black or white well that's what of... seemed to happen as i went on and read the book is that mm. it became more polarized mm -hmm. he said in the sort of late 60s there was some sensitivity but then as the environmental movement, and I, I mean, 
don't get me wrong, like this podcast and nobody here is saying that the Redwoods are not hugely valuable for a multitude of different reasons. This is exactly That's not it. the point we're yeah. making at all here. Um, but there are always knock-on effects of any big change of land use. Yes. And yeah. so, you know, it seemed to me that tensions really, really rose to yeah. the extent that there was, um, um, I saw some bumper stickers that you um, alluded to and one of them was, are you an environmentalist or do you work for a living? You know, people, I got the impression that people were getting really quite angry and there was a convoy. Oh, yes. Tell me about the convoy and the peanut. Sure. So um, I think first uh, it can help to you to kind of describe that um, around this time, um, there's not strict borders on the time, but, you know, we were really entering into something called the timber wars in the region. Um, and so around 1978, when the park was being expanded and, and kind of all brought in together, all those smaller parks brought into one management system, uh, the members of a t the town people of a town called Oric, uh, which is really right on the southern edge of Redwood National Park, it's what they call Gateway Town. So when you drive through, after you drive north through Oric, the minute you leave, you are in the park. So this, this is... The park and the town are so inextricable and a lot of folks really opposed the expanding of the park boundaries there for a number of reasons including loss, more loss of logging jobs um, as well as kind of like an expansion of boundaries that didn't really take into account what the townspeople kind of saw as necessary and you know a lack of consultation of a community that lives right in the town and so has a really kind of big stake in it and so in a response to that quite a few people got together and they decided that they were going to do a convoy and drive from Oric, which is right on the right at the western edge can i just interject of, you then so you've got yeah. a really helpful map i mean oh yeah you know listeners i hope you read the book because this is just slightly off topic, but the way you've set out the book is super helpful for my sort of brain. You've oh got a map God, and you've got a list of characters and then you've got a really helpful um, note section at the back. But oh, sorry, they went you. on this convoy. I've got the song in my head, convoy. Yes. <laughs> and um, so they're on there because they're angry, aren't they? They don't feel yes. like they're being heard. They don't. And so they've decided that what they're going to do is they're going to make a statement. And what they uh, what they did, so logging trucks, especially in North America, are just massive. I would never... Uh, you know, they're much, much, much bigger than a lorry. Um, you know, they are these really, really big shipping. They're almost like a ship, you wow. know, going down the road. And so a number of folks owned businesses where they, where they own these trucks. And so they could pack them up and drive, you know, they own the truck, they can do what they want. Um, and they got together and they did fundraising to send out essentially quite a few men from the community and eventually from surrounding communities to drive to Washington, D.C. on the other side of the country. And they decided that they were going to take um, a, a gift of sorts to President Jimmy Carter, who was the president at the time. And uh, he was known for having grown up and owned a peanut farm in the South. And so they uh, selected a piece of redwood trunk and carved it into the shape of a peanut and put it on the back of a logging like the bed of a logging truck so it was open to all and drove it across the country and and made pit stops in cities along the way kind of arguing against the the redwood national park expansion trying to kind of get their uh, public relations message out there and when they arrived in washington um you know they drove it right to the to the steps of the capitol park their trucks definitely not uh, you know you can imagine yeah. driving a big truck to London or something wow. and, and parking it there it's just not you could not feasible actually, not no, you London. actually couldn't I don't <laughs> think you could make it down the road with how wide these trucks are but um uh and and you know the president did not did not take a meeting with them he sent out um some of his representatives who declined the peanut and sent them back on their way so um there as you can imagine, was quite a bit of anger mm. at that. Um, 
and they yeah they drove all the way home uh with this peanut the peanut is now kind of on display in auric outside of a uh, business called the shoreline deli and market which is one of the kind of town hubs in a way it's the only petrol station only gas station and uh, it has picnic tables and and food and stuff so um you'll you can see the peanut there if you ever drive through and you went there so um yeah. aside from i mean at that time we just talked about with the peanut convoy there was a growing environmental awareness so there were completely separate groups of people yeah in a way the argument was becoming more polarized oh man and, and it was all a very dark the, time it was and all through the pacific northwest like um in the book i certainly focus a lot on north northern california because people uh you know very kindly spoke to me there um but the timber wars stretched all the way up into canada into british columbia and really the the root of that was that um a bird called the northern spotted owl uh, was endangered. Um, the northern spotted owl, uh, it, you know, lives only in old growth. It relies on old growth, um, uh, kind of biodiversity, uh, you know, and old growth ecosystems. And as logging continued throughout the Forest Service land, um, a, a lot of activists really lobbied to get the northern spotted owl uh, listed as an endangered species. And when that happened, when they were successful in that, it meant that any time a logging, like a logger or a logging company saw a northern spotted owl in the land that they were logging, they had to stop all, all operations and go through an environmental assessment review. Um, and it really took a lot of timberlands off of the, off of the market, essentially. And the northern spotted owl itself became, um, you know, a symbol of, of deep divide. So, you know, you were yes. talking about the, you were talking about the um, bumper stickers, and there were bumper stickers about, you know, like save a log or eat a, an eat an owl. Um, you know, really kind of quite. I mean, it's funny, but a little, you know, quite harsh yes. statements. Um, and that really sparked, uh, you know, a particularly angry time in the Pacific Northwest because you had now a symbol that everyone could unite either for or against. Mm. And this was a time then that was followed up by what you might like iconic images of tree huggers, people living in trees, like people setting up platforms in the highest branches of these trees and the the idea being that when they were up there if a logging company came by they they couldn't take down that tree because there were human beings in it they could hurt them uh there were there were tactics used on both ends you know there were literal brawls in the forest there were very dangerous threats um one of the former loggers there one of the poachers whose father is a former logger told me that his dad said that he would leave his hotheads at home during that time because he didn't want anything horrible to happen on his watch if there were essentially protesters out in the woods. Um, and the whole region was just taken over by anger in this way. How terrible. And I guess in an atmosphere yeah. of anger and fear and distrust, it's very difficult to have new creative ideas about how to resolve the problem just generally yeah, no that was almost that beyond the yeah no sorry for for uh, interrupting that was almost beyond beyond the point at some point do you know if that mm. makes sense I mean I don't think uh eventually it wasn't even about a solution it it became about sides yes black and white um, black and white and um that made things really difficult yeah. you know and that that remains today a very I think uh in the UK this is a problem mm -hmm. in North America it's a huge problem um you know there are a lot of this is but one example of kind of a much larger issue of polarization that has only recently just become really can feel quite overwhelming um and there were a lot of parallels in that um as I was writing, you know, that, that became kind of indicative of, you know, this happened in, mm. has happened in a region and now it can be applied to, to so much more. 
other industries. I was, re I was oh, reminded yeah. of um, the closure of the coal mines in yep. the 1980s in the UK and how yep. that affected entire communities. Again, yep. I'm not arguing the reasons why or they're closed or not closed. It's not the point I, we're making here. It's about the effect on people. And one of the exactly. things I absolutely love about your work was the humanity behind it, the fact that you were privileged in a way, if I may use that word, to spend time in this hub in Oric and I get to know the local privileged. folks yeah. um, in a way that was generous and open and non-judgmental and, and how great they were for you. I mean, you don't have to name names here, but do you want to talk about some of the stories of people's lives? You're sure. free to name so names if you wish to, it's up to you. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, the book itself follows um, two temper poaching cases, um, and then a kind of broader community around those two cases, because those two cases, uh, uh, both are based in Oric, uh, you know, the, the poachers are from Oric, um, and they are part of a community in, uh, in Oric, because Oric is so small. Um, and, you know, I had known through research uh, that burl poaching or burr poaching, I think in the UK they call burls Should we burrs. talk about that for a little bit? Mm -hmm. Because um, listeners might not quite understand. That's not everybody who listens is a tree expert. So okay. let's go okay. back to basics and then we'll come on to the people again. What sure. is burl? What are they? Sure. So poaching happens and looks um, kind of in all sorts of ways, you know, I mean, it goes from people lopping off the top of trees uh, to taking branches to taking whole trees. That's very common in other regions of the Pacific Northwest. Um, and in, in, in Redwoods in particular, um, the burl, or sorry, the poaching is really around burl, which I think in the UK they call burr. And, and burl um, is often these large lumps that grow off the side of trees, some usually at the base, uh, sometimes further up if they're if they're kind of an anomaly. They look like big bubbles off the side of the trunk. They're they're covered in bark themselves. Um, and the reason why they are poached, first of all, is that they're easy to lop right off. A lot of them, especially in Redwoods National Park, are massive. Uh, so one of the poaching cases that I follow in the book was a burl poaching case, but that burl was eight feet tall, you know, and and had to be kind of carved out of the tree over, over a number of, of trips. Um, and there, there's a strong market for it. Uh, it's very unique looking wood. Um, many people use it to... Um, make tables out of, to car, uh, spin bowls out of. So it has this really unique kind of wavy pattern on the inside. And that's where the market for that comes from. It used to be very common in the 80s and 90s that uh, burl would be taken from redwoods and sent to Europe and put into the consoles of cars. So if you ever saw that kind of wood interior you know particularly of a, of a kind of high-end or expensive vehicle um, that was coming from Burl. Wow. Um, so it had this very kind of upscale market and it has the benefit of being also a bit easier to poach than redwoods which are just the tallest trees in the world you know um, and very unwieldy and it would be very very difficult to to log a redwood and get away with it but taking a burl can happen over the span of two nights um, so it, it, the risk is a bit lower there. And leaving a massive gaping wound for the tree, potentially it for is. infection. Yep. But um, whilst we're talking about types of poaching, there are photographs in the book which are hard to look at, mm -hmm. you know, where planks are taken off the sides of large trees, where yeah. just a bit out the middle is taken out of a tree. And I think in some of the cases, the tree is left deliberately unstable, yes. so that it has to be felled. Exactly. And then it's planked up in the night. Yes. So there are many different forms. Um, before we go on to what happens about that poach wood, let's go back to these people then that, yeah. that you met you. in Oric and um, describe to me about their lives, um, the difficulties they had, the traditions that they came from. Sure. So um, I think I said earlier, but Oric is a, is a gateway town um, and it, you know, at the at its prime, it had a population of just over two thousand people. Um, but 
following the kind of 1980s 1990s decline in logging you know they now have fewer than 200 people that live there now um and so I knew that I was going to visit Oric because I had read uh, about timber poaching or burrow poaching from that region and um you know when I showed up I I started talking to people just at the shoreline deli uh, that that hub that I mentioned and some of the burl shops and um, everyone was really kind and, and very open and talking to me about what was going on with their town. They, they People really wanted to talk about what had happened to their town because, yeah. um, you know, this was a, this was a pretty steep decline. Um, and there, there was really strong memories around what the town used to be like and, and what kind of brought everyone together and why it had disappeared. And, um, once I started discussing the challenges of the town and what made the town good as well as difficult at times, um, you know, I started asking about a couple of folks. So Danny Garcia was one and Derek Hughes. These were the two cases. Um, and really, um, I think the fact that um, I had asked <laughs> was was enough. Um, you know, I've, I've said a number of times that I don't think anyone had ever reached out to ask either of them uh, about their cases and what why they had why they had poached. Um, and so, yeah, I entered into into kind of a, a relationship of some kind with them, where I, you know, we would talk. Um, COVID hit, uh, so I wasn't able to be there. Uh, again, but, you know, where we spoke fairly regularly about their cases and their lives. And, um, you know, we really took the time to dig into what growing up was like, uh, what their families were like. Um, it wasn't always about the fact that, why did you do this? <laughs> you no, know? not at all. Um, I think you deal with that very sensitively. And well, thank you. the book talks about difficulties in their family backgrounds and uh -huh. sadnesses which happened. And uh, the fact that, uh, and also, you know, just that loss of identity and who they are. I mean, I'm not advocating crime at all, no, I uh, but I, I absolutely love the way that you explored the humanity. So often you talked about what's happened in their lives and there are often links with drug use. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so this actually was presented to me first when I was doing kind of my introductory interviews on this topic, like long before I was writing the book. And, you know, I would be calling rangers or, or uh, local experts and asking why this is happening. And almost every interview was very consistent in saying that, you know, methamphetamines, meth use is a huge part of this. Um, the Pacific Northwest has um, a pretty strong tradition of meth being a problem. Um, you know, the history of how that drug was introduced to the region and and, and why it took off is itself very interesting. I mean, it is mm. an amphetamine. Um, loggers often have to work very long hours. So there was a real uh, desire uh, for, and and even the history of meth is, is actually really interesting. I mean, it was yeah. developed as a work drug, <laughs> you know? Um, and so a lot of these towns have really had um, serious challenges with not only economic depression, but what follows, which is often reliance on substances yeah. and, and turning to uh, turning to drug misuse uh, as a as a response to kind of really difficult um, circumstances. And, um, you know, definitely in Oric, again, a lot of people were talking to me and saying, like, I mean, the town has a meth problem um, and people steal to get money and then also to pay for drugs. Um, Isn't this a really common thread? I mean, I'm no social anthropologist, but you mm. see this throughout the globe where communities way of life has been taken from them. Mm -hmm. albeit for whatever reason and, and now in fact it could be climate change yes but aside from climate 100. change which is a huge subject for other podcasts you look at indigenous populations every single part of the world and they're housed in a way that isn't familiar to them 
their regular yeah. sources or the way of life is taken away. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it just happens and um, it's very, very sad. But um, it is in that it's it stems from a sort of I, I tend to say top down or a prescriptive approach mm. that, um, you know, in the case of the Redwoods and, and the Pacific Northwest, that approach is we can't do this anymore. Stop. Yeah. Uh, figure it out. Move to a new place if you need to. A lot of people don't have the money to do that. A lot of people don't want to. You know, mm -hmm. like I think it's very privileged to think that it's fine just to roll up into a new place if your work disappears, you know, and to live away from your family and the place where you grew up. I mean, that I might be comfortable with that, but other other people won't. Um, and so, you know, it all kind of bundles up in that way. Um, and what you're left with is this kind of really impossible seeming situation and in this case you know it led it leads to a very shocking crime uh, and an environmental crime that is just hard to imagine but it can be applied all over um it can be kind of yeah put onto other towns and their own perspectives you know absolutely and, and let's talk about the law enforces the rangers mm. Yeah. You went out with a couple of rangers. What does their yes? What does their job entail, and how difficult is it to actually um, bring these cases to court? It's really hard because you not only do you need to find the stump and say, okay, a crime has taken place here. I know that this tree shouldn't have been logged, but you then need to find the wood that matches the stump, um, and that that's really, really, really hard. Very rare. Um, so in a in a span over I think seven years, uh, Redwoods National Park found that there were um, hundreds of burrow poaching cases that had happened over this time. And really, I mean, I profile two of them. I, I you know I think um, the percentage that are that are found are just incredibly slim. And that's that stretches north as well and into other forests where the crime scene is in a really dense unpopulated area and then the uh the the body or the loot or however you want to put it you know um by the time you find both of those things uh you know many 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 weeks have passed and so it really has to be the right circumstances that that lead to it um and so that's what rangers are up against i think it can feel very overwhelming and partly I think that that's why when the stars do align that you might be able to charge someone um it, it becomes an aggressive case um mm. because here's an opportunity right um where perhaps there wasn't one beforehand and I'm guessing it's not the best resource department in the world and uh, not without its own risks to personal safety but Oh, I did. it's very dangerous, especially yeah. the Redwoods is considered mm. the da most dangerous um, national park. So mm. I did enjoy reading about one ranger who is very, very keen on his job because it's not just trees that are poached, as we know, there's all sorts of wildlife and special yeah. succulents and plants and salmon. Yeah. Tell us about yes. the ranger who oh, went to yeah, Terry Grimms. Yeah, so Terry Gross, um, he was a fish and wildlife ranger, which is a little bit different from a park service ranger, but that's just kind of semantics, really. Uh, you know, he was an investigator, wildlife crime investigator. And actually, it was in the same area that the Redwood Burl poaching takes place. It was a different era, but totally same region. And so he knew that there were uh, poachers that were illegally catching salmon during their run season when they are meant to be left alone so that the population can continue. And, you know, I think he uh, was very intrepid and kind of a very unique character. And he decided that the way that he was going to catch and ticket these poachers was not to show up with his headlights blazing on them as they fished, but to mimic a salmon. And so in, <laughs> in the middle of the night, he donned a wetsuit. He was all black, you know. Uh, he had his little ticket book in his breast pocket under his 
under, you know, so it was waterproof. <laughs> and he lied in this, um, he lay down in, in this uh, kind of, uh, what, what's the term, like an eddy? Mm-hmm. maybe uh yeah. where, where the where the stream was meeting the ocean where the pacific where, or sorry where the salmon were going up and he let the stream take him uh where it would be going or down towards where it would be going and uh he witnessed quite a few poachers that were using glow-in-the-dark lures uh to fish so they had no lights so that no one would know that they were there but they were using glow-in-the-dark uh, lures and nets and, and what have you to to catch these salmon and so he watched a glow-in-the-dark lure go over him he caught it attached it to his <laughs> wetsuit they <gasps> reeled him in uh, and he popped out and, and ticketed them so wow. that was the type of uh, and I have to say that that region I mean those are the type of people that want to work somewhere that's like yeah so unique um, you, you know it's it's not a city park at all you're dealing with really kind of wacky and quite serious crimes because like you're saying I mean it's dangerous right like Mm. Terry Gross was actually quite brave to do that because who knows like it's funny uh I mean yeah we're laughing because it's a fantastic tale that I want to see on a film you know you imagine this guy being (laughs) the hero of a film and I surprise yeah Yeah. um, I'm not a salmon but seriously though um we've talked a lot about the poaching, what the wood looks like, but how on earth is it sold? Because I'm, I'm I know yeah. that things are highly regulated. Yeah, what's happening in the US to get get the money for these products? Yep. Yeah. So it depends on the type of wood. Um, in the burl case, burl is almost always sold to a burl shop, which then will either um, contact artisans um, that they know might want to buy just like a slab of burl to either you know, to craft into what, what they're going to craft. Um, it gets a bit more complicated as you go, go north, but also quite interesting. So when it comes to Douglas fir, for instance, or Sitka spruce, all, you know, bo- uh, maple, cedar, all highly poached trees. Um, Douglas fir often ends up as firewood. Um, it can be moved very quickly in this region, just sold by the cord uh, yeah. or, or through the back of a truck. Other wood um, that, that might be in high demand for artisanal furnitures and things like that, um, it requires a sort of underground network. It requires someone who runs a mill that is willing to turn a blind eye, who might be willing to process that wood out of hours, uh, you know, and enter it into the system in that way. Um, but there are also, I don't want to put the blame entirely on mills because there are also cases where forged paperwork has really allowed wood that was rooted and growing in a conservation area to enter into the market and and the mill owner does not know. And a lot of that is really interesting, right? Because the paperwork might have the coordinates of where this tree came from or an address or or what have you. And is the mill owner meant to to go out there? Yeah, you know, no. Um, that that seems like a really inefficient. Yeah, of way. course. Yeah. Um, you know, there are some cases um of burrow poaching where people have listed on the on the paperwork when they sold it that it came from their family's private property, and then eventually mm-hmm. one day when the rangers are suspicious enough, they might go out there and find that there are no trees on that property or that you know there was there is a a a case of uh redwood poaching where someone put down their grandfather's address um and it looked very convincing um so and the the challenge is that once it enters the system how to find it you know all of this needs to happen within the span of hours if not maybe two days right so it can be very difficult to to be on it that quickly and that's that's very similar i think to the global scale right so um we can punish global manufacturers for buying wood that might not have very clear sourcing documentation but in the end the the tree is still been taken down and so it's really hard to it's just really really difficult to prevent in that way because eventually it's going to take maybe a bit longer than than is required 
I was really interested, though, to read about the role of science, mm -hmm. the fact that there is this DNA testing for trees now, the yes. DART, leading the dart to, um, is it CITES? Is it pronounced? CITES. CITES. Yeah, CITES, yeah. Um, Tell the... us about the, the passion behind the chap in the laboratory and, yeah, and what sure. innovation Ed... that is. Yeah, Ed Espinoza. Um so just to, for a very quick overview, CITES is the Convention on International Trade of Endangered Species. And if something is listed in a CITES appendix, it has various levels of legality in terms of how it can be traded. So it might be endangered or at risk of endangerment, depending on where it falls. And, uh, it, you know, primarily tropical hardwoods are, are really within this, these appendices. Um, and that by knowing where something falls, uh, you can then punish accordingly <laughs> and you can, you can manage your kind of imports and exports accordingly as well. Right. Um, and this is where organizations like the FSC are really helpful, um, because you can say, well, it's FSC certified and forest stewardship council certified, and therefore it might be tropical hardwood, but blah, blah, blah. Okay. So that's, that's where we land. Uh, still lot like tons and tons of the international wildlife trade is timber and the challenge with timber along with all of these other things we've talked about is that you might be a customs agent and we have this massive globalized economy and a shipping container comes in and you're a customs agent and it's filled with mdf furniture um, and you might think, okay, we've got intel that says that this furniture is made from a teak, a specific species of teak that is CITES listed, therefore it's illegal. And we want to try and prevent this from entering the market and punish the folks that have, that have done this. How are you supposed to tell? <laughs> you know, it's, it's impossible. And so... You know, I think one of the big examples of this was that there is a watch that was highly, it was an influencer watch on Instagram, right? And so it had a lot of back and forth and eventually it was found to be made from poached wood. So um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, has developed a forensics lab in Oregon. And that forensics lab looks at all types of environmental crime, but it also has this dedicated timber task force now. And what they've done is they use a mass spectrometry formula and they use a dart machine that can really specify down to kind of the most, the deepest level, what the species of a tree can be. So if that customs agent knows, okay, this, we suspect that this is poached wood, they can seize a piece of it and send it to the forensics lab. And what they'll do is shave off the tiniest sliver. I was so surprised at how small this is. And they can feed it into this dart machine that essentially um, is at a very high temperature and, and will heat the wood and, and um, the oils will evaporate or, or uh, become kind of condensation. Um, and they are absorbed by the dart machine that pumps out a sort of DNA profile. And Ideally, and what the what the lab is working towards now is to have standard profiles of each tree on the CITES appendices so that they can then compare uh, the seized wood to the to the database of, um, of, of appendices listed endangered spe species. And they can say, okay, we know we know that this is an ivory tree that shouldn't be, or sorry, ebony tree. That, that is illegal to trade and we're going to seize all of it. So it is quite exciting in that way. You Very still need good. a lot of intelligence I yeah. think, to get to the point, but um, it's the, the okay. identification process is really important. Um, and so. And mm -hmm. also we haven't got time in this interview, but you talk about your visit to South America as well, yes. but yeah. Um, so what is the solution to such a massive problem? We've, can see that um, it's really difficult to prosecute. The science mm -hmm. is helping with proof that it might be um, illegal timber. We can see there is a huge social and economic problem when we take away a means of living. 
but I understand that you live within a community forest. Perhaps you could explain what that is yeah. and how that works. Yeah, so I have a, a community forest just outside outside my window here. And, um, you know, I don't know, poaching still happens from community forests. I just want to put that out there. Yeah. But there are some management structures within them that can respond differently to that poaching. And so a community forest is essentially, you know, where, where I live, it was once uh, managed by the province. Um, so it was similar to uh, forest service land, or, you know, we would call it crown land here because it was owned by the government. Um, and a community organization has bought it and is now managing it through a board structure um, for community use, as opposed to only profit or only conservation or only tourism. It actually brings it all in together. And there are some examples of this across the province um, as well and around the world. Um, and the benefit of that is that the decisions are made by people that live where the forest is. Sometimes people still massively disagree, but there's a there's kind of a different feeling when you're disagreeing with your neighbor yeah. as opposed to a congressperson or a politician. Um, and in some interesting cases um, where poaching has taken place from community forest land, um, they were able to do kind of different problem solving activities. So there's a community forest just to the west of me that that was seen poaching. And they suspected that they knew who the poachers were. And they actually ended up offering them the opportunity to come and legally cut the firewood and take the firewood and and or what have you and and give it to their provide to their family if they needed it. And uh, that was a kind of very quick problem. Like, I don't know if it stopped entirely, but it was a very kind of um, community oriented solution that they could try that, you know, certainly a federal national park or a government, you know, national government run national park can't whip into action that quickly. And they might not want to be seen as doing that either, you know, and so this would they have some unique kind of problem solving measures around them. But, I, you know, to go back to Rory Young, uh, who I who we spoke about at the very beginning of the of the podcast, he, I mean, Rory Young was involved in all sorts of anti poaching measures. And his conclusion was that until you solve inequality, <laughs> Yeah. that poaching is not going to go anywhere. Um, and that is a huge problem. Uh, and that is a huge undertaking. But I also agree. It's yes, socio economic issue. It is a socio economic issue. I understand there's some really good models in Mexico, okay. of community forests that you write about in the book. And maybe that is also, you know, these community forests might be a blueprint whereby people have input and some agency over what happens but also some use of the forest in a way that's sustainable mm -hmm. and you were mentioning too um a little bit earlier but often um community forests are are, are run by ind local indigenous communities and yes. that's a really important aspect as well and even to the poachers who i spoke to who um you know in north america we would use the term settler uh, or uh you know they are they're not in they're not indigenous um, even the poachers were saying you know this is actually indigenous land you know this is yeah. not this is in the end we're you know they say that we're taking from the federal government but the federal government took it from someone else and I thought you know the poachers are saying this they understand that inequality and that that challenge um it's probably time that our management structures and our governments start thinking about it as well it's really good. And actually, you okay. um, you put a quotation in the book in the afterwards saying separating nature from human use has never kept it safe, mm -hmm. which I think yep. sums up beautifully. And um, what have you have you changed your point of view, having carried out all these in-depth research and got to know some folks? Have you changed your perspective on nature conservation? Oh, yeah. Big time. I think when I first started reporting it, I thought, well, this will be a straightforward story about good hearted rangers solving a crime that is horrible. Uh, and now I'm now I'm not so sure that national park structures are even <laughs> the 
right, you know, I, I don't know the right way. I, you know, I don't want to pretend that I do, but, uh, you know, I definitely look at conservation areas very differently now, um, in North America and even in the UK, you know, like I think, um, I think there are, there are ways, uh, that we should be thinking about how we work, how we are part of the environment as opposed to separate from it. You know, that's when we're talking about conservation being a colonial um, construct in a way. I think that that's really part of that. Um, you know, seeing yourself as different and above and, or maybe not above, but separate. Um, you know, I think that these are all really, we've, we've seen how um, misguiding that can be and and how it trickles down and, and hurts the vulnerable wow we've gone 360 on this we've looked at um the start of everything what's happening do you think the punishment fits a crime of poaching i think a lot of investigators um would argue no that the um that the incentive is still very strong because the chances of getting caught are low. And even if you do get caught, I mean, often the fines are in the low, in the hundreds or in the low thousands, um, which can seem really quite low for, uh, for endangering an old growth tree, you know? Um, but actually it's really interesting in Oregon there, there's, there are some scholars and there are some, uh, organizations that are working on a sort of restorative justice uh, approach to poaching uh, because it happens it happens so commonly um, around around this part of the world and part of that is um, requiring the poacher to work with the park to uh, do restoration around the poaching site um, and I'm very keenly watching to see how this will turn out I think that some of the poachers that I have come to know would actually be really good park employees. Um, and in, due to past run-ins and frustrations, they, you know, they're not going to apply to work at the park. But, uh, you know, people enter into professions in all sorts of ways. And, you know, when I, when I heard about this opportunity, that a, a turtle poacher received actually someone had been poaching turtles uh, and when they were caught they were ordered to work with the fish and wildlife service to do restoration on the poaching area and and all of this um, I, i'm really keen to know what the outcome of that is and in, including people uh, in the management that's that's really interesting and finally mm -hmm. lindsay what's your dream scenario yeah, I think um, I would love for that restorative justice process to work, actually. I think that would be, um, I think I would feel really motivated by that. Um, and I think the poachers would as well. Um, and on a town level, I think that, like, or on the local level anyway, um, stronger efforts to hire locally and to not transfer people so often within organizations that they might be working in Redwoods for two years and then leave. Um, I think that that can lead to some pretty rough relationship building on the local front with humans, um, as opposed to just managing the land. So. Well, thank you so much. What an absolute privilege it's been to speak to you today. And I so admire your thorough research and sensitivity and its deep probing into a really nuanced problem. I really recommend that listeners buy a copy of Tree Thieves, Crime and Survival in the Woods. So thank you, Lindsay. Thank you so much for having me. This was really fun.